Um, can cognitive science determine epistemology? So I'm going to start by saying something about why I mind about that question. I'm going to describe a conception of the epistemology of perceptual experience that I think is correct. Some people think the epistemic significance of perceptual experiences is determined by what cognitive science can equip us to say about them in a way that would rule out the epistemological conception that I think is correct. So I'll explain that supposed clash between cognitive science and the epistemology that I think we should embrace. Uh, and that should make it clear why I care about the answer to my title question. Then I'll go on to explain how we can both accept the epistemological conception that I recommend and acknowledge the promise and increasing success of a cognitive scientific approach to perception. So, first, how should we conceive the epistemology of perceptual experience? In some experiences, the subject perceives that things are a certain way. Hard to see how that could be wrong. Consider an experience in which someone sees that there's a flat surface in front of her, tilted away from her line of sight, at an angle that she can at least roughly gauge. In any real life case, of course, there'll be a whole lot more than that in what she sees to be the case, even if the only thing she has in view is a sloping flat surface. I mean, she'll see perhaps the color of the surface, its shape, its size, but that doesn't matter for my purposes. I want to consider a case in which someone sees at least that there's a flat sloping surface in front of her. We can ignore anything else that she sees to be so, focusing on that bit of what she sees to be so. Now, there's a fact that notoriously causes trouble when philosophers start reflecting about how experience affords knowledge. So, suppose someone's capable of experiences of that kind, experiences in which she sees that there's a sloping flat surface in front of her. It'll be possible for this person who has that capacity to have experiences such that in the absence of indications external to the experiences themselves that they're misleading, she would take herself to be seeing that there's a flat surface in front of her sloping at a certain angle, though she isn't. If there are no indications that an experience of this kind is misleading, as there may not be, she won't be subject to rational criticism if she takes it to be an experience of seeing, though it isn't. An experience can be such that its subject would innocently take it to be an experience of seeing that there's a sloping flat surface in front of her, even if there's no sloping flat surface in front of her, or, even though there is, her experience isn't related to that fact as it would have to be for the experience to be a case of seeing that there's a sloping flat surface in front of her. That's a big rigmarole, but there can be masqueraders, experiences that masquerade as seeings that something is so. That's the troublesome fact, and obviously it's not restricted to my example. We can acknowledge the troublesome fact, as it's bringing some terminology into play, by saying this. Experiences in which a subject sees that things are a certain way, and experiences in which a subject would innocently take herself to be seeing that things are a certain way, though she isn't, can be grouped together as experiences that at least seem to be seeings, that things are that way. Experiences that are seeings, that things are a certain way, are a subset of experiences that are seeming seeings, that things are that way. So we can say at least seeming seeings are a genus and it divides into two species, seeings and merely seeming seeings. I'm not working now with the idea of experiences in which it looks to one as if things are a certain way. I just bring that, that in, but I'm not going to work with it. Not all experiences in which it looks to one as if things are a certain way are seeming seeings that they are that way. If there are indications that an experience isn't a seeing, 
taking it to be seeing a seeing wouldn't be innocent. And that's how I put seeming seeings in place. So, familiar case, think about the muller liar illusion. It looks as if one of the lines is longer than the other, even to people who are familiar with the illusion, but their experience isn't a seeming seeing, that one line is longer than the other, not as I'm using that idea. Familiarity with the illusion alerts them to indications that the experience isn't a seeing. The indications don't alter the fact that it looks as if the one line is longer than the other. The experience is such that, for someone who wasn't alert to the significance of the indications, ah oh yes, that's that illusion, it would be a seeming seeing. If someone who isn't familiar with the illusion looks at the same diagram, she will have a seeming seeing, that one line is longer than the other. So um, experiences in which things look to be a certain way, are, that's an even wider uh, uh, genus than the genus seeming seeings. But I want to think about the genus seeming seeings and raise the question, how should we conceive the relation between the species, seeings, and the genus, seeming seeings? Now, the beginning of an answer to that question is obvious, uncontentious. More needs to be true of a seeming seeing than that it is a seeming seeing if it's to be a seeing. Seeings are seeming seeings, but there's more true of them. Obviously, things must be as they're seemingly seen to be. As philosophers say, the seeming seeing must be veridical. And that condition isn't enough. Someone might seem to see that there's a sloping flat surface in front of her, and there might be a sloping flat surface in front of her. So that condition of veridicality is satisfied. But it might be that what's seen in the seeming seeing is a trompe l'oeil depiction of a sloping flat surface actually in front of her, obscuring the sloping flat surface that's actually in front of her from view. Um, that's a situation in which the subject might believe there's a sloping flat surface in front of her, and if she does, I mean, she believes it on the basis of the experience, she'll be luckily right in her belief. But she's, that's just good luck. She's not seeing that there's a sloping flat surface in front of her. So to rule out cases like that as cases of seeing that things are a certain way, we need another condition over and above veridicality. We need to require a certain relation, maybe a suitable causal relation, between the fact that things are as they're seemingly seen to be and the experience that is seemingly seeing things to be that way. Now, that's only a gesture in the direction of a condition over and above veridicality for membership in the species, actual seeings, as opposed to seeming seeings. But for my purposes, there's no need to be more specific. What I want to do is to distinguish two conceptions of the relation between the species, seeings, and the genus, seeming seeings. Uh, the two conceptions diverge over what difference, if any, membership in the species makes to the epistemic significance of an experience. They're all seeming seeings, but um, does it make a difference uh, that, that, that one of them is a seeing? And to distinguish these two conceptions, what I'm going to go on to do, I don't need a precise account of what it is that singles out members of the species, seeings, from among members of the genus, seeming seeings. So here are the two conceptions. The first one, membership in the species makes no difference to the epistemic significance of an experience. Even if an experience is one in which a subject sees that there's a sloping flat surface in front of her, the warrant that it affords to the subject for believing there's a sloping flat surface in front of her is a warrant it affords only as the seeming seeing it is, and it is one if it's a seeing. It's a warrant it affords only as the seeming seeing it is, and it follows that the warrant isn't conclusive. Try it out. Suppose someone seemingly sees that there's a sloping flat surface in front of her. That's all you know about her experience. Well, that leaves open whether her experience is a seeing, and so it leaves open a possibility that there isn't a sloping flat surface in front of her. Certainly, some seeming seeings are seeings because they conform to those further conditions, whatever exactly they are. And if someone sees that there's a floating, a, a sloping flat surface in front of her, that entails that there is 
a sloping flat surface in front of her. Membership in the species, seeings, brings with it conformity to the condition that things are as they're seemingly seen to be. But on this first conception, that doesn't affect the warrant that the experience affords to the subject for believing there's a sloping flat surface in front of her. Even if the, an experience is a seeing, and what I've just kind of reminded you of is that entails that things are as they're seemingly seen to be, the warrant that the experience itself affords for believing that things are that way doesn't entail that things are that way. It leaves open a possibility that things aren't that way. So on this picture, conformity to the conditions for membership in the species, whatever exactly they are, is just extra to membership in the genus. And it's membership in the genus that determines the epistemic significance of an experience. Okay, that's the first conception. The second conception, obviously, is different in just that respect. On the second conception, if someone sees that there's a sloping flat surface in front of her, her experience itself makes visually present to her some environmental reality whose being a reality entails that there's a sloping flat surface in front of her. So her position in having the experience she has leaves open no possibility that there isn't a sloping flat surface in front of her. There are different ways of making this idea more specific. We might say uh, the experience, if it's an experience of seeing, makes present to her a state of affairs that consists in there being a sloping flat surface in front of her. Or we might say that in her experience, a sloping flat surface is present to her, presented as a sloping flat surface in front of her. On either of those ways, it doesn't really matter. On either of those ways of describing experiences, two different right, kinds of things that we're describing experiences that are seeings as making present to their subject. On either of those ways of describing experiences that are seeings, we can say that if an experience is a seeing, the experience itself makes an appropriate environmental reality present to the subject in such a way as to afford her a conclusive warrant for believing things to be as she sees them to be. On this second conception, to have an experience that's a seeing is to be in a position that excludes any possibility that things aren't as they're seemingly seen to be. So on this conception, conformity to the further conditions that define the species isn't just extra to membership in the genus. Membership in the genus isn't what determines an experience's <coughs> epistemic significance. Experiences that are members of the species, seeings that things are a certain way, have as such a distinctive epistemic significance. Going on with the second concep conception a bit, um, it's true that if an experience belongs to the genus, it's a seeming seeing, it's as such relevant to the rational credentials of a belief that things are as the subject seemingly sees them to be. If we know that someone seemingly sees that there's a sloping flat surface in front of her, we already know, even though what we know so far leaves it open whether her seeming seeing is a seeing, we already know that she's not subject to criticism on the score of <coughs> defective rationality if she believes on the ground of her experience that there's a sloping flat surface in front of her. Remember, seeming seeings are experiences that the subject would innocently take to be seeings. So she's in some sense in the clear if she believes that things are as she seemingly sees them to be. Now, a way of bringing out how the two conceptions differ is to note a divergence in how they understand this kind of warrant for belief, the warrant that an experience affords by virtue of belonging to the genus, by virtue of being a seeming seeing. On the first conception, that's the only kind of warrant any experience affords. Even experiences that count as seeings, by virtue of conforming to conditions conceived as just extra to membership in the genus. So this kind of warrant, the warrant an experience affords by virtue of belonging to the genus, has to be somehow autonomously intelligible, and it's going to look like a good plan to build up 
to whatever warrant the, other, the, the, those, the members in the species afford from there. <coughs> Contrast the second conception. The second conception makes serious use of the idea that seeming seeings are experiences that seem to be seeings. On the second conception, the relevance of a seeming seeing as such to the rational credentials of believing that things are as they're seemingly seen to be consists in the fact that someone who seemingly sees that things are a certain way seems to have a warrant for belief of the kind that would be afforded by an experience in which she was actually seeing things to be that way, a seeming case of the kind of warrant afforded by members of the species. The epistemic significance of members of the genus as such isn't autonomously intelligible. Sure, they have an epistemic significance, but it's intelligible only as a seeming case of uh, the episteme epistemic significance of members of the species. So for epistemological purposes, second conception, the species is fundamental. Okay, that was contrasting two conceptions, and now um, what I think is right, I think the second conception is right. In fact, on plausible con assumptions, the second conception seems to be just compulsory. If we reject the second conception, we threaten the very idea of perceptually grounded knowledge. A bit of background for this. Um, epistemology is a philosophical minefield just in so far as its topic is knowledge as an act of self-conscious rationality. We can restrict the topic for epistemology <laughs> like that without committing ourselves to uh, the unattractive idea, I mean, it really is unattractive, that animals that don't have self-conscious rationality can't have knowledge. Of course they can, of course um, they, they know things in their way. It's just that when we attribute knowledge to animals that don't have self-conscious rationality, as we surely do, we're not liable to the familiar predicaments and obsessions of philosophical epistemology. So restricted topic, knowledge is an act of self-conscious rationality. And now, th the self-consciousness that characterizes a bit of knowledge of this restricted kind ought to include awareness of its credentials as knowledge. What is it about how it is with me that, in virtue of which what I've got is knowledge? That should be right, within the self-consciousness of the self-conscious knower. We can understand that as an application of a much more general thought. A subject self-consciousness in any act of rationality should extend to how her rationality is operative in this act of her rationality. Attributing knowledge of the restricted kind, acts of self-conscious rationality, is, as Wilfred Sellers put it, placing a state or an episode in the space of reasons, a space in which rational subjects can self-consciously navigate, right? find, their ways, find their way about. And Sellers says, if someone has a bit of knowledge of this kind, standing in the space of reasons, she must be aware of the authority by virtue of which what she has counts as knowledge. So that's the, the Sellers' version of the thought, the self-consciousness of a possessor of a bit of knowledge uh, should extend to, extend to what makes it knowledge, extend to the, 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 the warrant, authority, whatever, by virtue of which what she has is knowledge. Now, an instance of perceptual knowledge, at least of the most basic kind, ought to be a belief warranted by a perceptual experience. And now just applying what I said, if the knowledge is an act of self-conscious rationality, the knower's self-consciousness should include awareness of how the knowledge is warranted by the experience that warrants it how the experience affords it the authority, sells this word, by virtue of which the belief is knowledgeable. And that makes the second of those two conceptions that I distinguished, on which experiences that are seeings afford conclusive warrant for associated beliefs, that makes that conception look compulsory. The self-consciousness of someone who has a bit of basic perceptual knowledge ought to extend to knowing how her experience warrants her in a belief that counts as knowledgeable by virtue of her having that warrant for it. 
And that should involve her recognizing the warrant as conclusive. If one's self-consciousness in a belief doesn't include awareness that one has a conclusive warrant for it, how can self-consciously believing what one does be self-consciously knowing that things are as one believes them to be? If one's self-consciousness in a belief leaves open a possibility that for all one's warranted in believing, things aren't as one believes them to be. How can one be self-consciously in possession of knowledge that things are that way? So we need a uh, self-consciously had conclusive warrant for uh, believing that things are a certain way in order to have something intelligible as self-consciously self had knowledge uh, in our sights. That's a very simple line of thought. Um, some people would say simple-minded, and uh, they're troops of philosophers who think it can't possibly be right. I mean, the application to perceptual knowledge, some people think perceptual knowledge shouldn't anyway be understood as belief warranted by experience. Some people think a less than conclusive warrant afforded by an experience can be all the warrant someone needs to have a bit of perceptual knowledge. If her belief is knowledgeable, it's in virtue not just of the warrant she has for it, but the satisfaction of some further condition. And there are all kinds of uh, possibilities for epistemologies for basic perceptual knowledge that refuse to accept uh, the simple line of thought. And I'm not going to go into detail about that. I think the simple line of thought is just fine. I mean, maybe my formulations of it could be fixed up, but the, the, the gist is clearly right. The second conception is indeed compulsory. If perceptual knowledge of the most basic kind is possible, it must be possible for experience to afford conclusive warrant for beliefs about one's environment, and that's what the second conception provides, the first conception doesn't. But now, uh, the topic for this lecture, which I uh, at last now get to, uh, is one of the grounds that have been offered for thinking that the simple line of thought can't be right. Um, we, we, we've got to swallow some version of the first conception. And the ground that I want to consider is that the, the second conception, the one I think is compulsory, is inconsistent with the cognitive science of perception. That's been argued by Tyler Burge, and I'm going to focus on a sort of truncated, uh, um, bare bones uh, version of the way he argues for that. So, according to the conception that I've claimed is compulsory, experiences in which a subject sees that things in her environment are a certain way, sloping flat surface there, are differentiated for epistemological purposes from experiences in which a subject merely seems to see that things in her environment are that way. If someone sees that things in her environment are a certain way, uh, for at least some substitutions anyway for that, that clause, she has an experience, I'm just recapitulating, she has an experience in which some relevant environmental reality is visually present to her. So the experience itself affords her a conclusive warrant for believing that things in her environment are that way. And that merely seems to be true in the case of experiences in which the subject merely seems to see that things are that way. So, seeings and merely seeming seeings with corresponding content aren't alike in epistemic significance. That's recapping the second of the two conceptions. But Burge insists, and he's right about this, that at the level of classification that's fundamental to the explanatory purposes of cognitive science, seeings and merely seeming seeings with corresponding content belong together. And he thinks that settles, that they belong together for purposes of epistemology. So, answer to my title question is yes. Burge thinks an epistemology that attributes different epistemic significances to seeings and merely seeming seeings with corresponding content is inconsistent with the results and procedures of an empirical science in good standing. Now that would obviously be very bad news for an epistemological position. Philosophy can't require us to contradict empirical science. 
But everything turns on the status of the assumption that the relevant region of empirical science, here cognitive science, determines uh, the thing we have to say in philosophy, here, the shape of an epistemology for perceptual experience. So I'm going to argue against Burge that the answer to my title question is no. Cognitive science can't determine the epistemic significance of perceptual experiences. So at least on this score, the episteme epistemological position that I've represented as compulsory can stand. Of course, there are many other uh, grounds on which people resist the simple query, simple-minded line of argument, and I'm not going to talk about them. I'm talking about this one. Now, as I said, Burge is right about cognitive science. At the level of classification that's fundamental to its explanatory purposes, the cognitive science of perception groups seeings and merely seeming seeings with corresponding content together. And in that respect, its sorting of states contrasts with the sorting that's needed by the epistemological position that I've recommended. The question is whether the contrast amounts to an inconsistency, which is what Burge thinks. So you are contradicting empirical sciences, uh, uh, what Burge thinks he can say on the basis of what I've just conceded. Let me say a bit to try to explain Burge's correct point. I, that's the third time I've said it, right? That, uh, Burge is right about cognitive science. Let me take, t take a, a, a while to try to explain um, the rightness. The kind of theorizing that Burge has in mind aims at, and um, when it succeeds, gives, illuminating accounts of how perceptual systems do what they do. We're looking for a kind of account of the workings of a perceptual system that explains, in computational terms, how starting from registrations of arrays of sensory stimulation, right, for instance, stimulations of retinal nerves by light, the system generates increasingly committal representations of distal circumstances, right? that's proximal stimulation, increasingly committal representations of distal circumstances, culminating in representations of circumstances that are perceived by the individuals whose perceptual system is in question. And then you can say, look, I have explained how <laughs> these individuals can perceive that, because look, the system intelligibly generates representations of that. An account of a perceptual system on those lines ultimately makes intelligible a differential responsiveness, typically imperfect, on the part of the system to the circumstances that are represented in those culminating representations. That is, circumstances whose obtaining is within the perceptual reach of the individuals whose perceptual system it is, the individuals whose perceptual capacities are up for explanation. The increasingly committal representations in the computational account of the formation of states in a perceptual system correspond to responsivenesses increasingly at risk of error on the part of the system to the circumstances that are represented by the representations, culminating in a responsiveness to circumstances that are, as I put it, within the perceptual reach of the individuals whose perceptual capacities are up for explanation. That's very abstract. Um, it may help to give an example. Uh, what I'm going to do is to sketch a, a sort of moronically simplified version of an example that Burge, uh, I mean, it, it, it is to a certain extent a real example. Burge describes it in more detail, actually kind of fascinating detail, but I would give, give an utterly simplified version of it. With the thought, the simplified version should be enough to give the flavor of the kind of theory, the kind of right, excellent scientific project that I'm talking about. And the example picks up the example that I used to introduce the idea of perceptions and merely seeming perceptions, which was on purpose because I wanted to talk about this simplified example. So consider how one might explain a differential responsiveness on the part of a visual system. That's a system to which the input is patterns of light impinging on retinas to the slope of a flat surface within the field of view of a perceiver whose system it is the angle by which the surface diverges from being perpendicular to the, to the line of sight, right? 
consider how, how one might explain a differential responsiveness to that. And start with a simplifying pretense, and this really helps. The system has to deal only with surfaces that are flat. We're not going to think about you know, bulgy or curved or whatever. Surfaces that are flat and that have a pattern or texture that has a certain kind of uniformity. I'm not going to try to define the kind of uniformity in general terms, but um, we, it'll do to work with an example. So imagine a surface uniformly covered with circular spots laid out in a rectangular grid pattern, each spot the same size, each spot at the same distance from spots to either side of it and above and below it, apart from where the pattern runs out at the edges of the surface, or maybe outside the field of view if the surface is so big that it takes up the whole of the field of view. If a surface describable like that is tilted away from being perpendicular to the angle of sight, the impingement of light reflected from it on the perceiver's retinas will be such that in the retinal images, that's the sensory arrays that the system registers in the states it starts from, the areas that correspond to spots that are further away from the perceiver, imagine it's like that, right, say at the top of the surface, will be smaller and closer together, this is in the retinal images, than the areas that correspond to spots that are closer to the perceiver. That should be a kind of familiar fact, yes. And then if we assume that the pattern of spots is uniform in the, in the way I described, it's a routine computational task to determine the angle at which the surface slopes, just from those differences in the retinal images, the assumption uniformity. Um, bare computation gets you the, the angle of slope. That is, the, fr from the differences in retinal image, that is, is from the differences in the sensory arrays that are the input to the system. And in the context of the simplifying assumption, that could be the beginning of a satisfying explanation of how a system realized in linkages between retinal responses and goings on deeper in a nervous system, somewhat as a computer program can be realized in a complex physical mechanism, would be differentially responsive to the slope of flat surfaces within the perceiver's field of view, flat surfaces from which light is reflected into uh, the eyes that um, um, in uh, 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 um, simulation of which uh, this computation, uh, from stimulation of which I should say, this computation begins. All right, that's um, very simple. Get a little bit closer to real life. Suppose a system sometimes confronts, I mean as our systems do, surfaces that aren't uniformly patterned or textured, but stay really simple. We can imagine uh, a, a, a visual system that issues in representations of angles of slope of surfaces in a way that can be understood in terms of the kind of computation I've, I've gestured at. Whenever its retinas are stimulated by patterns of light that are as they would be if the light were reflected from a surface with a uniform visible <coughs> pattern or texture, unless there are cues indicating that the pattern or texture on the distal surface isn't uniform, and we can imagine that these cues are dealt with somewhere else in the total theory. So if there's no pattern in the retinal stimulations, or if there are cues dealt with somewhere else in the theory indicating that there's a non-uniform pattern or texture on the surface, this system for representing angles of slope, as I've described it so far, can't yield a response. But otherwise, it does yield a response in a way that can be explained in the computational way that I've gestured at. To make things a bit vivid, we might say that the pattern or texture on the distal surface, um, um, sorry, if there is a suitable pattern in the retinal stimulation and no cues indicating that the pattern on the distal surface isn't uniform, the system, as it were, assumes that there's a uniform pattern and com computes the slope of the surface accordingly. That's only a bit of imagery. The system makes no assumptions. And it's only in an, in, in, in an extended sense that it makes computations, and I'm going to come back to that. But I'm just trying to give the sort of essential shape of theories of the relevant kind. And I think that's enough. Right, now what is on the table, if you've followed it, 
and, and it, it was meant to be <laughs> ultra simple, is a sketch of a primitive theory that might account for some of the differential responsiveness of at least some imaginable visual systems to get it anything like accounting for our ability to perceive that kind of thing, much more would be needed, but um, pretend and, and that's the beginning. An interesting way to test the hypothesis that a theory like that fits the visual systems of some perceivers, us for instance, would be by exploiting the possibility of illusions. This maybe brings it all home. If a visual system sometimes displays a differential responsiveness to angles of slope, intelligible in something like the way I've sketched, it ought to be possible to fool it, to induce it into misplaced responses. And you can see how. Pattern a surface in such a way that when the surface is in view head on, perpendicular to the line of sight, the pattern of retinal stimulation matches the pattern there would be if the stimulation came from light reflected from a uniformly patterned or textured surface tilted away from the angle of view. So you rig up a thing that is kind of like the pattern that I described, except that as you go up, say, on this surface, uh, the spots get smaller and closer together progressively. And now put that perpendicular to the line of sight, and it, you will expect uh, that it will look to be sloped away from the line of sight. So the theory yields a prediction that at least in the absence of external cues, there would be an illusion of a surface tilted away at a certain angle from being perpendicular to the line of sight. And then if the prediction's verified, we have a confirmation of sorts of the theory that the visual system that we're trying to understand delivers a differential responsiveness to angles of slope in something like the way that I've sketched. Now I noted right at the beginning in the sort of abstract general formulation that the differential responsiveness that is explained by a theory of the sort I'm talking about is typically imperfect. <coughs> and my, my example illustrates that uh, in what I've just said, that theories of this kind can be confirmed by ex uh, exploiting a possibility of illusions. That's just exploiting the imperfection in the responsiveness. So the system for which I've given a sketch of a theory would produce the response that ought to correspond to the presence of a flat surface tilted away at a certain angle, not only when a circumstance of that sort is present, but also sometimes when it isn't. And the response that ought to correspond to that fact. What, ought, what do you mean? Well, that reflects the functional role that the system would play in the life of perceivers whose system it is, which has got to be something like enabling them to know facts about spatial configurations that confront them. Now, if a theory explains a responsiveness that's displayed by a perceptual system, the explanation carries over in a way that should be just obvious to a responsiveness on the part of the perceivers whose system it is. And the imperfectness that I've just been talking about characterizes by both re responsiveness on the part of the system and responsiveness on the part of perceivers. A corresponding responsiveness on the part of perceivers has an imperfectness corresponding to the imperfectness that belongs to the responsiveness of the system. In fact, that's what we're exploiting. If we verify predictions of illusions in order to confirm a theory of a system, the illusions are states of perceivers. In my example, they're seeming perceptions of angles of slope that aren't the perceptions they seem to be because the appearance is a mere appearance. It's generated, the theory says, in an imperfect exercise of the responsiveness to such circumstances that the theory explains. And now all of that brings out how right Burge is to insist that for the explanatory purposes of a science that aims at explanations of perceptual capacities on those lines, perceptions and merely seeming perceptions with corresponding content belong together. But a theory of the sort that I've given an ultra simple example of it would enable us to make intelligible any seeming perception of the angle of slope of a seemingly seen surface. At any rate, in cases in which the angle of slope is, or at least seems to be available to vision in something like the way the theory can cope with, and that's part of the idealization, any perception, seeming perception, 
the explanation is the same. The way the theory explains a seeming perception would be indifferent, as between cases in which the seeming perception is a perception and cases in which it's a merely seeming perception. Of course, there are differences between perceptions and merely seeming perceptions. And it's not as if those differences are beyond the ken of a cognitive scientist. I actually said this a while back. If a seeming perception is a perception, the perceptual system is operating as it ought to in the relevant respect. It's fulfilling its functional role in the life of the perceiver, underwriting her capacity to get to know environmental facts of the relevant sort. If the seemingly seen angle is an illusion, the perceptual system is malfunctioning. And of course, cognitive science can register the difference between proper functioning and malfunctioning on the part of a perceptual system. But the difference between proper functioning and malfunctioning is external to the intelligibility that we find in a perceptual state when we explain it as an outcome of a differential responsiveness on the part of a perceiver Right, corresponding to a computationally explained differential responsiveness on the part of a perceptual system. When we explain a perceptual state in the way I've sketched a primitive example of, we trace its etiology no further back than to the sensory arrays. In my example, the retinal stimulations that are the input to the perceptual system. That's something that Burge insists on in a sort of reflection on the, the methodology of this scientific discipline under the title of the proximality principle. The explanations can, can't go further back than proximal stimuli. Explanations of perceptual states in this style are not sensitive to differences in the distal etiology of the proximal stimulations that they start from. And proximal stimulations, in my example, retinal stimulations, are relevantly alike, as between visual perceptions, perceptions of slope in my example, and visual illusions, illusions of slope in my example. So the intelligibility that explanations in this style would find in perceptions of slope and illusions of slope would be the same, both generated by a, a, a system of this sort doing its thing. In the one case it's functioning properly, in the other case it's malfunctioning, but that's external to the intelligibility found in the state by its being generated like that. And of course the example generalizes. The intelligibi intelligibility we find in a state of a perceiver when we see it as an outcome of a differential responsiveness corresponding to a differential responsiveness in a perceptual system is the same. Whether the state is a perception or a merely seeming perception. So, as I said, Burge is right about cognitive science. Cognitive science explains aspects of the representational character of perceptual states in a way that doesn't discriminate between perceptions and merely seeming perceptions with corresponding content. The process that generates a merely seeming perception, starting from input to the perceptual system, and that's what it has to start from, is indistinguishable from the process that generates a corresponding perception. The distinction between perceptions and merely seeming perceptions is external to the workings of perceptual systems in terms of which <coughs> cognitive science explains them. My schematic example illustrates that, and Burge gives richer and more realistic examples of actual theories that explain the workings of perceptual systems in the way my example schematically illustrates. But it seems reasonable to think all differential perceptual responsivenesses should in principle be explicable in that style. How else? I mean, it's actually very beautiful. I mean, there's lots of success and, and the idea of a, a way to explain these things is, is just fine, very attractive. But how can all that not rule out the epistemological position that I tried to represent as compulsory? Perceptions have a kind of epistemic significance they don't share with merely seeming perceptions. Well, here's the answer. Though those cognitive scientific explanations explain 
aspects of the representational character of perceptual states, that's not the only kind of intelligibility that perceptual states have. Those explanations don't address the intelligibility perceptual states have when they're conceived as possessors of epistemic significance. Though concession to Birch, we can, in principle, sometimes actually, increasing body of actual science, explain perceptual states as products of computationally intelligible differential responsivenesses to features of the environments of perceivers. But that doesn't exclude their being also intelligible as acts of capacities to be in perceptual states in which environmental realities are perceptually present to perceivers, the, the kind of language I used, setting out the second conception. Such capacities, capacities to be in uh, perceptual states describable like that, are fallible. They can have defective acts. In a defective act of such a capacity, a subject merely seems to have an environmental reality of the relevant kind perceptually present to her. But a non-defective act of a capacity describable in those terms is by definition a state in which the subject has an environmental reality of a certain kind perceptually present to her. <coughs> and that fits the epistemological position I tried to represent as compulsory. If someone has an environmental reality of a certain kind present to her, she's in a position that leaves open no possibility that the environmental reality isn't actual. So she has a conclusive warrant for believing some belief that might gloms onto the actuality of this environmental reality. Sorting perceptual experiences into defective and non-defective acts of capacity specified like that is sorting them in terms of their epistemic significance. Non-defective acts of capacities of that kind have a kind of epistemic significance that they don't share with defective acts of such capacities. We can differentiate perceptions and corresponding illusions for epistemological purposes, even though they belong together, concession to Burge, at the level that's fundamental for the intelligibility they can in principle, and sometimes actually, be revealed to have by explanations of the sort that cognitive science aims at and sometimes provides. As I said, uh, capacities to have environmental realities of certain kinds present to one are fallible. They can have defective acts. And uh, there's a kind of correspondence between that, the fallibility of such capacities, and the imperfect imperfectness of the differential responsiveness, that responsivenesses, I should say, that cognitive science explains. I mean, we might speak of defective and non-defective acts in both contexts. So back to the differential responsivenesses. If a perceptual system is, as it were, misled into a response to a sensory array that wasn't caused by an instance of a kind of environmental circumstance that it ought to be responding to, the response is defective. But the distinction between defective and non-defective cases has a significance if we're talking about fallible capacities to have environmental realities present to subjects, that it doesn't have if we're talking about imperfect differential responsivenesses to environmental realities. So as I explained, conceding to Burge, the intelligibility we're enabled to find in perceptual states by an account of the workings of a perceptual system, that intelligibility is indifferent to whether the perceptual system is functioning as it ought or malfunctioning. Of course, there's a difference between proper functioning and malfunctioning, but the difference is external to the intelligibility we find in a response if we explain it in terms of computational goings-on in a perceptual system, goings-on initiated by registration of an array of sensory stimulation. That's Spurge's proximality principle. Uh, the explanations can't go back further than the proximal stimulations. 
But perceptual states can also be explained as acts of capacities to have environmental realities present to perceivers. And if we explain a perceptual state in those terms, it's integral to the intelligibility we're finding in it, whether the state is a defective or a non-defective act of the relevant capacity, not external as in, as in the other context. Suppose we explain a perceptual state as a non-defective act of a capacity specified like that, a capacity to have environmental realities of a certain kind present to one. It belongs to the intelligibility that such an explanation finds in the state that it's an instance of what the capacity is specified as a capacity for. So it's a perceptual state in which an environmental reality of the relevant sort is perceptually present to the subject that enters into the, the distinctive kind of intelligibility found in the state when it's explained as an act of a, 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 a capacity to have environmental realities present to one. The essential point is that there are two different modes of intelligibility. And I think once we see that, we see that they don't compete. When we explain a state as an outcome of a differential responsiveness to the environment mediated by input to the senses, the intelligibility we're finding in it is revealed by an explanation that traces its etiology no further back than the relevant sensory input. The subject's competent inhabiting of her environment is external to that intelligibility in the way that I've been harping on. That's just what the proximality principle states. But we can explain the same state as an act of a cognitive capacity. And when we do, our understanding of it includes whether it's a defective or a non-defective case of the subject's competence in inhabiting her environment. It's not just that the epistemological position I tried to represent as compulsory isn't ruled out by a proper respect for cognitive science. There isn't the inconsistency that Verge thinks there is. I want to um, end by saying a couple of things in the direction of um, f something like fighting back, as it is a, a stronger thing to say. Cognitive science needs epistemology. Cognitive science needs a self-standing understanding <coughs> of the epistemology of perceptual states on the lines of the position I'm representing as compulsory for its conceptual apparatus to be so much as intelligible. I've been acknowledging that cognitive science explains in its way aspects of the representational character of perceptual states. But we should step back and ask what licenses us in describing the explananda in those terms, states with representational character. I mean, if a state is a product of a differential responsiveness to a certain kind of environmental circumstance, that isn't by itself enough for it to be correctly described as representing the environmental circumstance. I mean, think about it. The case I thought of was shivering, um, imperfect differential response to cold temperature in the environment. Not a representation of its being cold in the environment. So there's got to be more to get the idea of representation into the picture than just um, explicable differential responsivenesses. But look, the states that cognitive science explains aren't just products of any old differential responsiveness. They're also acts of capacities for knowledge. That's to say they come under the scope of the other kind of explanation. That's why it's appropriate to describe them as representing certain environmental circumstances, the circumstances of which they are perceptions or misperceptions. So it's only because the states are also a topic for a different inquiry, epistemology, in which it's a live option to credit perceptions with a kind of epistemic significance not shared with merely seeming perceptions, that cognitive science so much as has its topic the representational character of perceptual states insofar as that's intelligible in terms of their being products of responsivenesses to environmental circumstances. And the conceptual dependence of cognitive science on epistemology goes further, or deeper maybe, than just that. <coughs> 
When I gave my general description of the kind of theory of perceptual systems that cognitive science aims at and sometimes achieves, I said, the systems generate increasingly committal representations of distal circumstances, culminating in representations of circumstances that are within the perceptual reach of the perceivers, whose perceptual capacities are up for explanation of this sort. Only the last representations, the ones that are within the, the ones where what's represented is within the perceptual reach of the perceivers, have content that corresponds to things that perceivers are enabled to know by the operation of the system. Typically, in a theory of this sort, there are intermediate representations generated in the system that are, as people say, sub-individual. Not within the, 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 what's represented isn't within the reach of the right, perceivers whose capacities to perceive is being explained. Um, it's hard to illustrate that in terms of an example as ultra simple as my very simplified example, because it's plausible that everything that my imagined system can be said to compute is within the perceptual reach of the perceiving systems whose system it is. I didn't think, talk about intermediate representations. There are the sensory arrays and then quite a quick um, uh, geometrical or trigonometrical or whatever it is, computation, and then um, the angle of slope. But the need for intermediate representations whose content isn't available to the subjects, whose perceptual systems are in question, is pervasive in real life cognitive science. So we have to step back and ask ourselves, what licenses us in describing these intermediate states as representations? I'll give the story about what licenses us in describing the culminating states as representations. Um, they have content matching the content of perceptions um, by, by the perceivers. But the, 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 the intermediate states are not in general such that their content is available to the perceivers whose perceptual capacities are up for explanation. So uh, the answer to the question, what, what, what licenses us in talking about representation here, can't be exactly uh, the one I gave for the culminating representations. The intermediate states aren't perceptual experiences. That, that's the point of saying they're sub-individual. I think the reason why it's all right to describe them as representations must be something like this. Describing them as representations is essential to explaining what these perceptual systems do in the way cognitive science does. Namely, as getting from sensory arrays to content that's available to perceivers by computation. So it kind of matters that the story is computational, that the inter intermediate states are representational. And now what licenses us in describing what the systems do as computing? And I don't mean to be being skeptical about whether that's okay. I don't, we just need to ask what, what, what's, the, um, what's the ground for, for, for it being okay? Uh, you may not like this, but let me say it. In the primary sense, computing is something that's done comprehendingly by self-conscious subjects. Sub-individual systems compute in something like the sense in which the machines called computers compute. It's a perfectly good sense. It's actually indispensable to an understanding of what the things that it's applied to do. But it's a derivative sense. Its intelligibility depends on what makes it appropriate to apply the concept of representation to the ultimate results of the processes that we describe as computational in this derivative sense. With computers, the machines I mean, the ultimate results are representations in what's already a derivative sense. We call the thing that appears on the screen a representation because that's what we, we do with it. Whereas I've been assuming that experiences, I mean perceptual states of perceivers, can be non-derivatively non described as representing environmental circumstances. That's a difference. It doesn't completely matter for the point I'm trying to make. In both cases, the reason the intermediate states count as representational is that they're stages in processes that count as computational. And the processes count as computational because they issue in outcomes that count as representational, either in a derivative sense, as with computers, 
or not, as with perceivers. In the case of perceptual systems, the outcomes count as representational because they come within the scope of self-standing epistemological reflection, not determined by the procedures and results of cognitive science. So, so far from being able to dictate the shape of epistemology for perceptual experience, the cognitive science of perception owes its conceptual apparatus to its connection with epistemological ideas that have their credentials independently as a kind of um, priority to uh, philosophical epistemology in, in, in equipping cognitive science with its conceptual apparatus. Um, I'm at the end, you'll be pleased to know. Um, well, I've been in this lecture assuming that experiences are representational. And of course that's disputed. Um, in my next lecture I'm going to consider some questions about the credentials of that assumption that um, experiences are representational, but that's for, for tomorrow. Um, thank you for listening patiently.